Thanks, Patrick. Um, I'm representing the Geotechnical Research Group, which is part of the Civil Engineering Department, and I'm looking at the geotechnical challenges for offshore wind energy. So in an Irish context, um, we have seven offshore wind turbines installed, which represents 25 gigawatts. Um, so they were installed back in 2003, when offshore wind was still at its infancy. Um, and at the time, that, was, that placed Ireland as a world leader in offshore wind. Since then, we haven't installed any more turbines. So um, that's slowed down significantly. But last year, the, they released, the, the Irish government released a document, the Offshore Renewable Energy Development Plan, which identified six areas around the Irish coast um, with a potential for 13 gigawatts of electricity generation um, from offshore wind in pretty much in the immediate term. Um, so this hopefully will kickstart the, the offshore wind sector in Ireland. In a UK context, the, um, the UK government and the Crown Estate were much more progressive. So they identified nine sites in early 20, late 2009, early 2010 um, for development. These nine, nine sites are 32 giga, will produce 32 gigawatts of electricity when they're completed in 2020. So the problem with these nine sites, not so much a problem as, as a challenge, but the challenge is that um, there's additional engineering um, issues like increased water depths and more complex ground conditions. Essentially, obviously this is round three, it implies it's been around one and around two. So round one were, were primarily demonstrator projects, round two were the first kind of release of industrial um, scale offshore wind projects in the UK. Those projects were essentially the low-hanging fruit, um, the easy sites, good wind um, with very minimal constraints on the, on the kind of construction of the wind farms. So these additional nine sites um, have those extra challenges. Now obviously as you go further offshore, the, the turbine stays approximately the same cost, whereas these challenges increase the cost for foundations. So as a percentage of the overall, overall project, the foundation becomes progressively more and more expensive. And that's kind of what's, um, what's driving our research. So in terms of the, the foundation costs, when you add up the cost of fabrication, design, installation, and the, and the surveys involved, it comes in at around 30% for a near, near shore turbine. So that's for what's been done before. So as we go to deeper waters, this is going to be 40, 45% of the cost. Um, now, given the size of the sector in the UK at the moment, which by 2020 will be 100 billion, um, so that's about a 40 billion foundation industry. So it's, it's pretty large. In terms of foundation options, there's a whole lot of technical solutions out there, including gravity bases, which are just dead weight, large diameter piles, which are driven in, um, and then jacket structures that bridge the, <coughs> bridge the, ground, bridge the, uh, the water depth from the, from the seabed up to the turbine. Um, but again, existing experience is, is, is very much on this monopile. It, it's on one foundation element that suited those low-hanging fruit sites. So you don't have this kind of, this breadth of experience that industry needs to go forward. So there's a whole lot of design questions that are, that are out there that have to be answered in order for, to meet these targets by 2020. Um, so this, this kind of research isn't research of, of tomorrow. It, it, it is truly research of today. It's questions that have to be answered in the next year or, or a couple of years. <coughs> in terms of the water depths that have been, the water depth of sites that have been developed and the water, the water depth of the sites that are coming up for development, there is a transition away from shallow water into deep water. So the, um, this is just a frequency plot of the operating wind farms on, on a global basis. And you'll see that most of the wind farms are concentrated less than 20 meters, um, in water depths less than 20 meters. Whereas in future sites, these are, these are pushing to 25, 35, and up to 55 meters. Now I'd stress as well that these are mean water depths at a given site, whereas normally these sites are so large that the water depth varies across them. So at a given site, you might have a, a range from 20 meters to 50 meters. So it has a mean water depth somewhere in between. Um, so you could have water depths extreme of 70 or 80 meters that, that <coughs> need, need to be developed in the next round of, of wind farm constructions. So where, how do we design them? Where do the design procedures come from? Um, largely for the offshore wind sector, it grew so rapidly that research didn't have time to catch up with industry. So what happened was the industry went out and built them and used the, the best available design tools. So what they did was they took the design tools from the offshore oil and gas sector, um, which, which was all they had. So that progressed. The issue is that 
the offshore oil and gas sector have their own specific design challenges, and they don't necessarily translate to the offshore wind. So in, in the oil and gas, you've got these big, heavy platforms, high dead weights, um, whereas for offshore wind, you have much more dynamic loading, low vertical loads, high horizontal loads, very high overturning moments. So it's, it's a completely different set of design, criteria, design constraints, constraints, but you use the same design tools. Um, so questions have to be asked as to how, how applicable are these design tools and is there efficiencies that can be developed. In terms of scale, there's also a huge shift. The oil and gas sector use elements that are maybe one me piles that are one meter in diameter, whereas for the offshore wind sector, you have piles that are up to six or seven meters in diameter. So when you develop empir empirical design tools um, for the offshore oil and ga gas sector, they apply for a narrow database, and then you're extrapolating well outside that. So what we're looking at is how applicable are the design tools? Can they be optimized? Just just to translate, this isn't just a, an academic question. It's a, it's a real industry problem. We were asked to do a review of some tenders that came back for one of our industry partners. So they were, they were installing a structure, an offshore structure. They got a series of tenders back, all for monopiles. So they're all this kind of um, design. They all used existing oil and gas design codes. And they came up with foundation weights that varied from less than 200 tons to over 600 tons. So the, the difference in cost was somewhere around 2.5 million pounds. Um, and the, the reason for that difference in cost is because of the uncertainty in the industry. So the, the lack of, of, of available, um, available frame, design frameworks, procedures, and codes means you're getting huge variations in design that need, that, that need to be uh, improved. The same thing applies to, for a range of structures. If you take typical design codes, for uh, jacket structures, you get lengths, pile lengths that range from 5 meters to 20 meters. So huge variations. So where we're coming from is if you can reduce the pile length, if you can reduce the foundation uh, weight, you reduce your installation time, you reduce your vessel capacity, you reduce your installation risk. Um, and the reason it's so, this is so important for offshore is because these vessels that you use, are, they could be 100,000 to 400,000 pounds cost per day. For, for an offshore project. So if you can save a couple of days off the project, straight away you're into millions of pounds. Um, in terms of how we do this, we're looking at developing new design tools. That's the kind of, that's where we started from. And more recently we've been asked to optimize and improve the efficiency of existing structures and of emerging concepts. And then in the last year we've started developing our own offshore foundations and substructures. Um, so this is one of the existing concepts that we've been asked to optimize and validate the design. So we've got, um, that's just accelerometer blocks with polyurethane cable that we installed. That's part of the structure being assembled. And that's it going to um, the North Sea. So thanks for your time. Um, I'd just like to thank our, our industry partners that we have at the moment, Mainstream Renewable Power being one. Um, we're also funded by Science Foundation Ireland, Enterprise Ireland, um, and the European framework.